Hello and welcome back. And I want to thank all the nice people that support this channel on Steady. Here we continue now our measure theory series and today we do part 7. The most important topic for today will be the monotone convergence theorem. Before explaining this very important convergence theorem, I first want to start showing you some essential properties of the Lebesgue integral. Recall we have introduced the Lebesgue integral for non-negative measurable functions defined on some measure space x. For such functions we now know that the Lebesgue integral is well defined. And the notation we have chosen is this integral symbol where we put the measure space x here, the function f here and the measure itself goes in with d mu where mu is the measure defined on x. The integral is well defined now means that this symbol is a number between 0 and infinity and in the worst case it could be the symbol infinity. Also we call this symbol was defined by a supremum over all step functions that lie pointwisely below f. Okay, now I want to collect some properties that follow immediately from this definition. So let's choose two of these nice functions, which means they are non-negative and also measurable. Now we have the following. The first thing would be if both functions coincide, then also the integrals coincide. However, of course, this is trivially fulfilled. Therefore, I want to weaken the left-hand side a little bit. Here I want the functions to be equal mu almost everywhere. The abbreviation one chooses here is always AE. So mu AE means mu almost everywhere. This means now that the functions don't have to be equal, but they should be equal almost everywhere with respect to the measure mu. More concretely, this whole property here means that you look at the set of all lowercase x in our x, for which this property does not hold. So you have f of x unequal to g of x. Then this whole set should be of measure 0 with respect to our measure mu. In other words, if you put the whole set into the measure, you get out 0. This means that the Lebesgue integral cannot see things that happen on zero measure sets. Maybe for a visualization it's good to recall what we had for the Riemann integral. If you integrate a continuous function with our classical Riemann integral, you get out the area between the graph of the function and the x-axis. And now if you change the function at one point, so the result is a non-continuous function now, and then of course you don't change the area here at all, which then means the integral is the same. For the Lebesgue integral now this works in an abstract sense, which means that you can change the function as much as you want as long as the set of all these changes has measure 0. I will talk about this later in another video when I show you a lot of examples. Here I want to continue with the second property which is the monotonicity. It is descriptively given by saying that if a function is bigger than another one then also the area here should be bigger. However, as before we need the less or equal sign only almost everywhere. And then we can conclude that the integral of f is less or equal than the integral of g. And now to the last property which is related to the first one. I want my function f to be 0 and also mu almost everywhere. Now by using a I know that the integral of f is therefore also 0 because the integral of the 0 function is 0. However, here I want to emphasize another direction. If the function has an integral of 0, then we already know that the function has to be 0 
moo almost everywhere. Please don't forget that we only consider non-negative functions here. So all the areas we consider are above the x-axis and therefore positive. Therefore there is no cancellation whatsoever with positive and negative areas here. Well, now I could say all the three properties are easy to prove, so you could do this for yourself. However, I also want you to learn some technical steps here and therefore I will do the proof of B. After seeing this proof, I think you will be capable of doing the proof A and C for yourself. If not, please ask in the comments. For starting the proof, let us choose a simple function h. This means that we have a representation with characteristic functions. So we know we can write it as a finite sum, maybe we end with n, and we have constant ci and also sets ai where we put that into characteristic functions. The corresponding sets here should be measurable and therefore the simple function is always measurable. And the other property of a simple function is that it only has finitely many values. Therefore, there's always a canonical way to write down a representation for a simple function. You're forming the sum over all the values. So you have t in and now comes the image of the simple function and I write that as h of x. Then instead of c we just have this t and then comes the characteristic function of a set I will now describe. There we have all the x points that fulfill that if I put in this point in my function I get out this special t. There you see this is a representation that is allowed. And often it is very helpful to choose this special one because you don't have to define n or the ci's or the ai's, you just write down this representation. And also the integral can then easily be written down. As always it is defined by our sum and now the summation goes over t in the image of h. And then simply t times the measure of this set. So we have mu of the whole set where I write all the x that fulfill hx equals to this t. And to make it a little bit easier, you can always ignore the zero. So you omit the zero as an element in the image because you don't change anything for the integral here by multiplying with zero. The question for you is now, what happens if we change the simple function on a set which has measure zero? In order to investigate this, I need a little space here, so we push this one here to the bottom now. Okay, maybe a quick sketch is helpful here. So this is the whole measure space x. And now let us split that up into two sets. So this one would be the big x tilde. And of course, the complement, the whole rest. is just x tilde c, the complement of x tilde. This means that our x is now divided into two sets where I want that the x tilde complement has measure zero. And with respect to this set with measure zero, I want to change our simple function. And of course I call it h tilde and define it by using two cases. The first case would be as before, so h tilde x is equal to hx for all x in x tilde. So nothing changes on the green set. But on the gray set I will set it to a new value and I just choose an a. So this is for all x in x tilde complement. And a is now just an arbitrary chosen positive number, so 0 to infinity. By definition this is of course again a simple function. Because the set x tilde, I didn't say it, but of course it should be in the sigma algebra, so it should be measurable. And then we can write down again a representation for this step or simple function. 
I can use the representation from before. So now let's go over all the values of the original function h. And now I know it only occurs for x in x tilde. So I write down t times characteristic function. And now I put only the axis from x tilde into this characteristic function. Not included in the sum is what happens outside of x tilde. And therefore we add this one as the value a times characteristic function. And now we have all the x in x where h tilde is equal to a. But this is simply x tilde complement. So we can write in short just this x tilde complement here. Okay, I have explicitly written down the representation because then we can write down the integral as well. Now i of h tilde is equal to the sum with t over h x and here we have t times the measure of this set plus a times the measure of this set which is again x tilde complement. However, you already know the measure of x tilde complement is zero. So this whole thing here on the right is still zero. That simply means we can just omit it. And now you should see the differences above and below are not so big. The only real difference is the tilde here. Yeah, because the zero does not make any difference as I said before. Our task is now to fill in the middle ground here. Now it depends what you find easier. So maybe we come from the bottom and just use what we know there. So we have mu of the whole x. And now we just split it up into x tilde, where the condition is fulfilled. Union. And here we have just x tilde c. Now, obviously, this is the same as the bottom part, and we know it's a disjoint union, which means we can easily use the sigma additivity here. Therefore, parenthesis here, and here I write plus, or maybe first close the parenthesis here as well. Uh, so this would be black. Then plus mu of this set. However, we already know that x tilde complement is a set with measure zero, with or without this condition. It only gets smaller with the condition, which means this is still a set with measure zero. And now we have all the equalities here. We just add a zero here. So this is equal and this is equal. Everything is equal, which means the integral of h tilde is equal to the integral of h. This means now that we can change the simple function on a set with measure zero as much as we want. Indeed, this is a very important result and you can use that yeah, for proving some of these parts here, but we wanted to prove part B. There we have two measurable functions where the one is bigger than the other one almost everywhere. Therefore, now we know how to choose our x tilde. It simply should be the set of all x, where f of x is less or equal than g of x. Then by assumption, we also know that x tilde complement has measure zero. Well, then let's look at the integral of f. By definition, it's the supremum of all integrals of step functions and we denoted them by s plus, where the step function or the simple function is less or equal than f. Now by the result from before, we know that we don't change the integral value when we change the step function on a set with measure zero. Therefore, the supremum is still the same when I put in our step functions, where I have h tilde less than f, but only on x tilde. That is the whole point. 
if we change something outside of x tilde, we can't change i of h tilde. So the whole supremum is the same as the supremum here on the left. Very good. And now we can use what we know from f and g. On x tilde, g is always bigger than f. So we have here always this inequality. Hence, if we write down the same thing again, but now with g instead of f, then this set gets bigger than this set, uh, because there are more step functions, uh, maybe, inside this set. Therefore, we have an inequality at this point. Now, with the same reasoning as before, the supremum is equal to the supremum where I ignore x tilde and use step functions on the whole set x. And this one is exactly the definition of the integral of our function g. And if we put everything together, so this one, the inequality, and this one, we have proven our claim. And this is the monotonicity property of the Lebesgue integral, where we only need this inequality almost everywhere. Okay, so this one was a long proof, and I showed you all the technical details because we need them again when we prove the monotone convergence theorem. However, maybe let's first state the monotone convergence theorem. Remember, this was our goal from the beginning of the video. The first condition is that we have a measure space. So a set X, sigma algebra, and a measure mu. And we also have some non-negative measurable functions, fn and f, from x to 0 to infinity. And as I said, they are measurable for all n in n. And in addition, they satisfy two properties. First, they are monotonically increasing. So we have f1 less or equal than f2, less or equal than f3, and so on. And this holds almost everywhere. So mu almost everywhere. This always means that the points x where this condition is not satisfied form a set with measure 0. And the second condition is that the pointwise limit of the sequence of functions is equal to f of x, also mu almost everywhere, uh, for x in x. Okay, here is now an x, and we say it holds almost everywhere, which just means, okay, there is a set x tilde, where this one holds, and a complement of x tilde has measure 0. And this one is just the common abbreviation of this. So we just say x and x move almost everywhere. And then everyone knows what we mean. And now the monotone convergence theorem states that we can push the limit inside the integral. Hence the limit of the integrals fn dmu is equal to, okay, limit inside means integral over x. And the limit inside is just the function f mu almost everywhere, so we can put f the mu here. And that is the convergence theorem. Now you know when you can push the limit inside the integral when you have a monotonic sequence of functions. Indeed, such convergence theorems are mostly the best advantages the Rebecca integral has over the Riemann integral. And therefore, I really want to show you the proof of this monotone convergence theorem. However, this is a thing we will do in the next video, because this video is already very long, and it is good to do a short break. Maybe now recall everything we did here in this video, and then maybe you can come to the next video, where we do the proof of the monotone convergence theorem. I really hope you will be there, so then see you next time.